It is early morning. Ukka is moving slowly through the thick growth towards the entrance of a cave. The clouds have gathered above, veiling the gold and red colors of late autumn in gray hues. Ukka climbs the cliff and reaches the mouth of the cave. Using a bow drill, Ukka quickly produces fire needed to light a small animal fat lamp. For Ukka, the cave is a sacred place. Every life form around Ukka originated in darkness. Plants grow from the black earth and humans and animals come to this world from their mother's caves. As darkness grows, Ukka's senses sharpen. The feet touch the cold ground and the faint sound of dripping water echoes through the fresh air. Ukka's heart races every time at the thought of how vast and otherworldly the cave looks on the inside. But to connect with the eternal forces, Ukka needs to walk deep inside its eerie darkness. Finally, Ukka enters a chamber covered in beautiful paintings of animals and hunters chasing after wild horses, deer and ibexes. Some of these paintings are Ukka's work. The images are the offerings to the eternal forces in the hope that they will protect and preserve Ukka's people way of life. This time Ukka has come for a different purpose. Ukka has a personal request to make. All nature's signs suggest that the winter ahead will be cold and long, and Ukka will need good health and fortune to be able to feed and protect the family. Ukka's hand carefully examines the surface of the stone wall, searching for a boss to grip or a concavity where the hand will fit nicely and make the connection with the cave natural. Once the right hand is in a perfect position, Ukka leans on the wall and whispers the prayer. Holding a reed straw in the mouth, Ukka dips it in a hollow bone containing ochre pigments diluted in water. One sharp blow is enough to diffuse a cloud of red color around the hand. For a brief moment, Ukka is entirely out of breath, light-headed and disoriented. It appears as if all Ukka's life force was sacrificed to seal the holy connection. Soon, Ukka will leave this dark place with a sense of peace that accompanies those who know that a force much potent and greater than themselves is looking after them. Had this short story been written only 20 years ago, Ukka would have been an adult male person. Today, we have evidence that Ukka, one of the first Paleolithic artists, was in fact a woman. Welcome to another episode of New Creative You podcast. My name is Peja, I am a creative professional and the host of this show. I created New Creative You blog and podcast so that I can share with you interesting and inspiring stories about creativity and practical tips on how to expand your creative thinking. Stay with me in today's show in which I reveal the stunning proof that the first artists in human history were women. Some 20 years ago, almost all scientists had the opinion that the Paleolithic cave paintings were made by adult male cave painters. Even the small hand stencils that they were sometimes able to observe did not lead them into thinking that they might originate from, 
for example, a female hand. Instead, they explain them as the marks left by the sub-adult male hands. Human handprints, positive images, and human hand stencils, negative images or silhouettes, occur in cave art on every inhabited continent. The largest and best known set of caves containing hand stencils is located in southern France and northern Spain and is associated with the Upper Paleolithic cave art, meaning that they are 40,000 to 12,000 years old. The first scientist who suggested that not all of these handprints were male was Dale Guthrie in 2005. His close observation of hand stencils led him to the conclusion that almost 90% of them were made by people other than adult males. At that time, Dale Guthrie did not have the tools to prove his assumption, but the research methods that were developed in the meantime proved that he was right. Recently, the science of sexual dimorphism has come to aid the study of hand stencils that appear in Upper Paleolithic cave art. Human hands are sexually dimorphic. Male hands tend to be larger than female hands, but there are also consistent differences in the ratios of certain finger lengths. The pioneer in the study of the medical implications of human hand sexual dimorphism in populations was John Manning. His work led to the publication of a more general work on digit ratios in human populations. Research by Manning and others offered compelling evidence of sexual dimorphism of human hands, but it also showed that each population has to be treated separately. Another scientist, Dean Snow, led a research that used a set of metrics to measure a human hand to establish the differences between male and female hands. The team analyzed handprints of modern Europeans and compared hand size and digit lengths in males and females. Eventually, they were able to develop a system that allowed them to correctly identify the sex of hand scans through simple inspection at a better than 90% rate. They decided to use the same system to analyze hand stencils in the Upper Paleolithic cave art examples. Still, they were faced with the dilemma whether the hands of the modern Europeans have undergone an evolutionary change over more than 30 millennia. If that was the case, their metrics could not be used. Genetic research shows that over 95% of all modern European Y chromosomes belong to a set of 10 lineages that have been present there since the Upper Paleolithic. The stature of early Upper Paleolithic people was similar to that of modern Europeans, so there is no basis for arguing that adult male hands might have been smaller than they are today. Hand robustness had also to be taken into account. A modern individual whose daily work is largely outside and includes physical labor is likely to have more robust hands than an individual who does not engage much in such labor. European Upper Paleolithic people were hunter-gatherers that lived and worked in a physically demanding cold environment. Hence, the scientists expected that the hands of both sexes had wider digit widths than those of a modern reference population. Dean Snow and his team photographed and examined hand stencils in the caves in France and Spain that were in the condition valid for the analysis, meaning that the stencils were complete and preserved well enough so that the exact shape of the hand could be discerned. Their analysis showed that only a quarter of all hand stencils were made by males. 10% adult males and 15% sub-adult males. The rest, 75%, were made by females. If someone stopped you in the street and asked you to name a few female painters from the top of your mind, how many artists would you be able to name? Frida Kahlo, Georgia O'Keeffe, maybe 
Tamara Delimpitska or John Mitchell and that would probably be it. If, on the other hand, you lived 30,000 years ago and were sitting with a friend somewhere behind the bush waiting for a deer to pass and your friend asked you to name a few male cave artists, you would probably have the same problem. Besides Europe, cave paintings, handprints and hand stencils can also be found in Latin America, the Sahara, Indonesia, Australia and Tasmania, in almost all regions inhabited by modern humans. Today we can only witness the art that was hidden deep inside the caves, but imagine the art that was painted on a stone outside the caves. Art painted on wood, animal skin, human body, art that did not survive till today. The art of Paleolithic people can't have been only magico religious. We must presume that our ancestors also created visual art for purely decorative purposes, to tell stories through pictures or to leave a mark of their existence, the same as modern graffiti artists. After all, why do artists create? For no particular reason, because they have to, that is in their nature. Why should cave artists be different? And with creativity being so tightly integrated within the human psyche, even without these findings, it is logical to presume that great many of them must have been women. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please like, comment and share it with your creative friends. If you are interested in finding out more about creative thinking, please visit my blog at newcreativeu.com. There you will find interesting articles about creativity and lots of practical advice on how to improve your creative thinking. There you will also find links to my social media profiles so you can follow me and stay up to date with what is going on with the new Creative You project. You can also subscribe to my mailing list, the link is in the description, to get access to new Creative You secret page where you can download free ebooks and other digital material that will keep your brain active and creative. I have one final request for you. Please stay healthy and creative.